Now to the deep hole facing states. The pandemic has ripped a hole into every state budget in the country to the tune collectively of over $550 billion. That's more than half a trillion dollars in money that states don't have, which translates into millions of people losing their jobs and services being decimated that we rely on every single day. And it doesn't have to be this way. If ideology wasn't more important for Republicans and some Democrats who should be pouring money into states and closing those big deficits, deficits that, remember, were no fault of states, these sudden steep drops in revenue weren't caused by local mismanagement. The deficits were simply caused by one man, Donald Trump, who dismissed the pandemic, called it a hoax, and made fun of people. People who at that time knew, especially experts, medical experts, who knew that there was a building calamity. Trump essentially caused the economic crisis that is burying states in mountains of red ink. To talk more about this, it's great to have on the show Michael Leachman, Vice President for State Fiscal Policy at the Center on Budget and Policy Priorities. And maybe before we dive into the specifics of the deficit and the crisis facing states, Michael, maybe we should give my viewers, my audience, a little bit of the bigger macro picture. Perhaps it's obvious. Why should we care that states have these deficits and are facing this crisis? Why does it matter? Well, it really matters to our families and our communities because states and localities are primarily responsible in our country for funding our education systems, our schools and our higher education systems. They're, uh, they're, they have a big role to play in our healthcare system. Something like 90% of the public infrastructure in the country outside of defense is owned at the state and local level. So, you know, if states don't have money to do those things, then it really has a big impact on our lives. Mm -hmm. And to add to that, I assume there are two aspects of this. Obviously, when states can't pay for services, then all of a sudden the garbage collection suffers and all sorts of other things. Parks go unserviced. Uh, uh, I know that, for example, in my state in Oregon, just because of the state crisis looking forward, they furloughed and cut jobs they normally have in the summers, and they've had to close some campgrounds because they simply can't keep up with the ability to service them and make them safe for people. And then you just multiply that 10, 20 times bigger, and you can just see the way services are affected. And, and we're going to get into this in specifics, it's jobs. I mean, there's real um, jobs at the government and local level, but certainly at the state level that affect the incomes of people. Yeah, that's right. I mean, states and localities have already laid off about a million and a half, laid off or furloughed uh, about a million and a half workers. And, um, and as you say, that has an effect on the, obviously the, their income and their family's ability to put food on the table it also has a broader economic effect because it means those people aren't spending at the local hardware store or whatever. And, uh, and so it worsens the recession and, and makes it harder to, to, get a recovery, to get a recovery going. And then of course, as you allude to, there's uh, effects on the services, the crucial basic fundamental public services that um, these workers are providing as teachers and as, nurses and uh, and uh, and 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 park district uh, su supervisors who are running youth programs, et cetera, uh, all of those services uh, that people and businesses rely on. And it, you made a great point about people not being able to spend at the local hardware store. And this is where it seems to me that the Mindless ideology is taking over smart economics, and I mean mindless ideology, especially from the Republican Party in Washington, that just – they don't want to give aid to states. There's something somehow bad about that, and if you in fact want to have an economic recovery, which 
apparently that's the only thing that the Trump administration cares about is what the economy is doing in the pandemic, not that thousands of people are dying and hundreds of thousands of people are being made sick and potentially suffering health consequences for decades to come. It's a reality that if you're not going to give money to states to do all the things we just discussed, you can't look for an economic recovery, however that's defined. Yeah, states and localities are big part of the economy, and that's a lot of workers, uh, you know, about 20 million workers nationally. And, uh, and so <laughs> uh, neglecting, allowing uh, states and localities to lay off workers and uh, cut back on their spending, cut contracts to businesses, uh, cut back on their spending in other ways, just from, a, I mean, setting aside the human effects, which are, uh, you know, the most important um, uh, effects, just the purely economic impact is substantial. And uh, it really, it really is a no brainer uh, to provide, to make sure that states and localities have that will have what they need um, to avoid those layoffs and avoid those spending cuts. I mean, we, the economy is already bad. Why? You know, the last thing that we need is is more layoffs. So other they're, they're than totally being, unavoidable. <laughs> so other than being dumb economics, it has to be just mindless ideology. I mean, you're based in Washington. You've watched this process go back and forth. What else is the reason for not giving money to states other than mindless ideology? Yeah, I think, I mean, the reasons that have been given don't make a lot of sense, right? It's uh, as if it's only a blue state problem. This is a blue state bailout, which is obviously not true. The pandemic has reached every state, state blue and red state revenues are, are down substantially. In fact, some of the red states have the deepest shortfalls be because they have a combination of the pandemic and oil prices falling and some of the oil dependent states have especially deep shortfalls. Um, or, right, you, you hear that um, states already have enough, they've gotten some aid already, that's, that's enough when it's very clear it's far, <laughs> what the, the little bit of aid they've gotten so far is far too small given the magnitude, the sort of extraordinary and historic magnitude of the crisis. So yeah, I do think that it comes down, appears to come down to uh, ideology. You know, um, uh, they, in the one of one form, the primary form of aid that's been provided so far, uh, the Treasury Department ruled that that aid could not be used by states and localities to make up for their revenue losses, um, but but they could give it to businesses who had whose revenues were down. Because, or because of the pandemic, but you can't give it to uh, to protect. So that's protecting jobs in the private sector, but you can't give it to protect jobs of teachers and healthcare workers and other in the, others in the public sector. And it seems like there's no good reason for that. We don't have two economies. We have one economy, and there's no there's no reason to make a distinction between the pri public sector and the private private sector in terms of the economic effects. And one last macro point, and then we'll dig into some of the important numbers that you've pulled together, you and your colleagues. It seems to me that one of the other points about this being mindless ideology is that actually the federal government, and especially, I'll just be direct, the Trump administration and Donald Trump made this worse by ignoring the pandemic. I think this is just a fact that we all know now that had the government responded, the federal government seen this as a serious issue back in January and February, the actual economic crisis might have been much more smaller. It would have been contained, the pandemic, perhaps within a month or two. Again, we know that it's hard to chart all this, but in a, in a way, the federal government and especially the Republicans in government in the United States Senate, especially Mitch McConnell, they're blaming states and saying, we're not going to let you deal with your deficits, your shortfalls, even though it was really our screw up that caused you to have this. In other words, it wasn't as if states mismanaged their finances. They did something wrong. They were overspending, God forbid. It was, in fact, the screw up at the federal level that caused 
the pandemic to blow up, to explode, and the states to suffer. Yeah, I mean, it's pretty clear compared comparing uh, what's happened here to what's happened in other countries. I'm not a public health expert, but but it's very clear that the pandemic is the cause of the fiscal crisis in states. It, you know, states actually um, had managed their their uh, rainy day fund. They'd saved relatively large amounts heading into this pandemic. They had about 50% more in their rainy day funds as a share of their budgets than they did heading into the Great Recession. Um, spending general fund, state general fund spending as a share of the economy was significantly below where it had been heading to the Great Recession. Um, their unemployment insurance trust funds were most in most states were met the Department of Labor standards for being prepared for a recession. But nobody could have expected that we're going to have a global pandemic and we were going to have to um, shut down our economy in order to keep us safe. And that is very clearly what has caused the fiscal crisis in states. So, you know, any suggestion otherwise that it is a, is a distraction and, and, and rhetoric. So you gave a great lead in to kind of dig into some of these numbers. One of the things that I noted in looking at your excellent charts and looking at the decline as a percent of pre-COVID-19 revenue projections is that the real disasters that states are looking at are actually in the budgets of 2021 and 2022, as I assume their revenues decline even more and they deplete whatever reserves and rainy day funds they have. Is that right? Yeah, that's basically right. I mean, the keep in mind that uh, in almost all the states, the we are in fiscal year 21, because in most states that started July 1st and will extend into the middle of next year, right? So it's, it's this year and the subsequent year um, that states will continue to have shortfalls. They already closed sizable shortfalls for their 20, fiscal year 20, um, you know, it was sort of, it, the pandemic hit in the last, more or less in the last quarter, they had to, their revenues declined substantially um, uh, and they had to make cuts in order to balance that budget. But now they're looking at a fiscal year where their revenues are way down. They have already spent some of their reserves as, as you note uh, and, um, and most of them have written, at this point, they're still waiting on the federal government to do the right thing and, and step up to the plate. So most of them have actually written budgets that they know they're gonna have to come back and rework. Uh, and so if, we, if federal government shirks those responsibilities, states are gonna have to come back and they're already planning to come back in special sessions or um, to take action in other ways to cut their, they have to balance their budget. So you have to cut spending or raise taxes or some combination of those things in, in order to move ahead. And that'll continue into next year. Uh, in the fiscal 22 is starts in the middle of next year. And the projections that we have from all of the forecasters that people look at, the Federal Reserve and the Congressional Budget Office and others indicate that, or, you know, they think that, and, and that's pretty widespread that Forecasters believe that unemployment will still remain relatively high at the in the second half of last, next year, and that will funnel through to less revenue for for states and less ability to pay for teachers and healthcare workers and others. And to put it in regular people's terms, when people are unemployed and the economy is still in the ditch, people can't pay taxes. They the sales in places where states rely on sales taxes. Obviously, people are not buying stuff, and so the revenue essentially shrinks to states, which then in turn means states have to look at cutting services. And then I want to talk specifically now about cutting jobs. You mentioned, and I remember this statistic elsewhere in the last few weeks when I've been talking about this, that 1.5 million jobs have been lost either through layoffs or furloughs to date in the first few months of the pandemic. What's right. the projection of how many people could lose their jobs at the government level, local and state, from your point of view, let's say in the coming year, if money is not forthcoming from the feds to make up these gaps? Yeah. 
We haven't done a specific projection of that, but it's a substantial number. I mean, you know, we're, we're talking about uh, states, as I said, states are kind of holding on. They're, they're doing their best to wait, and, uh, but, but more, more layoffs and more permanent layoffs, not most of what's happened so far have been furloughs, and the hope is that some of those people get, at least will get their jobs back, but more permanent layoffs coming. I saw somewhere projection, and I actually don't remember the source right at the second, of somewhere around another 2 million jobs in the first, through the first six months of 2021. Does that make sense to you, roughly? I, I, wouldn't, I, wouldn't, be, I wouldn't be surprised by that number. Um, and I, I'm sorry I don't have that in front of me. I know that the Economic Policy Institute uh, has done some projections um, that I, I wish I'd carried with me. But... Uh, but folks could check that out, and, and I wouldn't be surprised at the number that you're, that you're quoting. Now, another aspect of this, obviously, is people's pensions. And what's interesting to me is there's not been a whole lot of conversation within this discussion about aid to states about the way in which pensions have been hit for public employees and retirees. And again, if you're thinking about down the road, economics, and having the economy retire. When retired people and people retiring now or say in the next few years, they don't have money coming from their funds. And if those funds are depleted, especially in, in situations where pensions are not defined benefit pensions, but defined contribution pensions, meaning the defined contribution pensions are often tied to where the stock market is, the concern is that people have lost, again, retirees, money in their pensions in the same way that they lost money during the Great Recession. So retirees, public employees who've worked hard through no fault of their own are getting hit again. Now, the stock market seems to have recovered a little bit, which is a whole other topic about how crazy that is that the stock market seems to be operating completely separate from the reality of actual people. Let's put that aside. But the truth is that people continue to get hit in their IRAs and what they're relying on, and public pensions are a fundamental part of that. Yeah, absolutely. I'm related to that. It's it's a real concern that states whose revenues are really squeezed will um, will turn to cut back to, to cuts to benefit yeah. cuts. That's certainly what happened in the aftermath of the Great Recession. That um, you know the the, the fact that the states didn't have the revenue was then used as an argument to say, well, the only response here is to cut back on on uh, substantially on pension benefits. And you did see, I think, I think every state had some kind of um, changes in their in their pension systems uh, over the last decade. And and in, in and in general, that what that's meant is that for new employees. Uh, the ben the pub pension benefits that are available to them are substantially weaker um, uh, than than they are than they were before the before the Great Recession hit. I want to weave in another aspect of this, another theme into how government cuts affect real people, and that has to do with racism. Since we're in this moment in the country where, thank God, we're talking about racism in a much more explicit way partly and largely because of the murder of George Floyd and the uprising in the streets. But government cuts and state cuts really affect people of color disproportionately from white people, and in two ways. And I want you to comment, first of all, on this one, which is that disproportionately people of color, especially African Americans and Hispanics, have government jobs. And in part, that's largely because if you were African-American, you tried to get in the private sector. Racism was a serious block to that, at least in the public sector, affirmative action and somewhat of a more transparent process happened so that African-Americans and Hispanics were able to get government jobs when they were blocked from getting fair employment in the private sector. So, for example, as I remember the statistics, I wrote them down, 20 percent of African-Americans uh, hold government jobs, meaning of government jobs, 20% are African Americans, and for 10% are Hispanic. So there's a certain, there's a large part of racism that weaves through government cuts, right? Yeah, absolutely. And, and in addition, the cuts that typically happen 
fall hardest uh, on uh, on the, on families that are struggling the most. And because of historic racism and ongoing forms of discrimination and bias, those people are disproportionately people of color. Uh, and 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 um, and so it's not just the. Co I mean, we already have, for instance, uh, a school school system nationally where uh, where schools that are attended disproportionately by children of color receive less funding than uh, than schools that are that are more heavily white, and so cuts for for schools that are already underfunded, and for kids that need more support because of this environment that we've created through our policies, um, you know that the pain is felt the most. There's a, there's a whole range of other uh, damaging effects. I mean, another thing that happened in the aftermath of the Great Recession is that we funded in funding our courts and our police systems, we shifted away from using general taxation to more heavily to criminal legal fees and fines. So we saw this play out in Ferguson, Missouri, for ex instance, where the police department was um, was uh, raising significant amount of their revenue and and was being told to raise revenue by you know going out and getting fees from people who had a hard time affording it. It's it has all kinds of damaging effects. People end up getting locked up just because they are you know don't have the money to be able to pay the fine. It ends up having all kinds of uh, deleterious effects. And I want to circle back to a point that you made and and kind of underscore this part of this racism within the economy that happens is direct result from generations of racism because of the creation of a wealth gap, essentially, that people of color have less wealth, family wealth compared to whites. And this goes directly to your point about schools. And your colleague, Nicholas Johnson, wrote a terrific article about that, which he talked about racial inequities, and he focused on specifically schools, and I'm just going to quote from his paper, that cuts in state funding, for example, force K-12 public schools to rely more heavily on local funding, which comes mainly from property taxes. And obviously, when those taxes, now I'm not quoting from him, I'm just riffing, those taxes are based on property values, and when you have that wealth gap, and you look at where schools are and where wealthy white neighborhoods are, Therefore, their property taxes are higher. There's more wealth that comes out of white neighborhoods. Those schools tend to be then better funded than schools where um, in predominantly people of color neighborhoods and where essentially from redlining and from the huge wealth gap. And so there it, it's a it's a very subtle thing that's not talked about, but has huge impact on certainly children. Yeah, that's that's exactly right. I mean. Our government policy deliberately segregated uh, African Americans in certain neighborhoods and disinvested in those neighborhoods, and so yeah, you, you end up and and uh, you know the way the market works, there's there there's uh, you know more white people who don't want to live in the, in the black neighborhood, then the value of those properties is going to um, be diminished. You know that's 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 another that's another part of it and. And because we've never come to terms with that or dealt with that directly in our policies, we are still in a situation where um, many of those same neighborhoods don't have the, the property wealth that, uh, that white neighborhoods do. So there's a, there's a direct effect on wealth. And as you say, that funnels through, through uh, school funding to the education that children in those neighborhoods receive. I'll say one other thing, one other aspect of that is that we have a property as tax assessment system that often has racially discriminatory effects, um, you know, because it doesn't consider the factors that we were just talking about. And um, so often you're just looking, you're just looking at the sort of the square footage of the house or that sort of thing, and you end up over assessing uh, for property tax purposes the value of a home in a in a low income black neighborhood compared to a um, you know a higher uh, a middle income white neighborhood so you you sort of getting on both sides the value of your house is lower because of those policies and your 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 tax assessment results in higher higher taxes than would otherwise be the case mm.
So here's my wrap-up question for our conversation. I tend to be an internal optimist, and even in a pandemic, in the situation we're in, I have a certain amount of optimism in this way, that coming out of this pandemic, millions of people, I think, will realize how corrupt and dysfunctional our economic system is, not to mention our social system. And I wonder if then there's a conversation to be had about how we restructure our economic system to make a much healthier society. And it's specific to this question about state funding, not to take away at all the problems of state funding directly related to the pandemic and the notion that the federal government should put billions of dollars into state and localities. Doesn't this give an opportunity to say, wait a minute, Shouldn't we be, in fact, taxing rich people higher in states, at state levels? Shouldn't we rethink the way in which we give out subsidies to corporations, especially at this local and state level, subsidies that are really about, in my view, uh, economic blackmail that bear that give no economic benefit to communities? So isn't this a time to engage the way in which states look at their budgets and create a much more fair society? Yeah, I think that that we'll see that over the next over the next couple of years that, you know, I mean, it's very likely that that even in the immediate term, the federal government isn't I hope they do, but they it looks like they're they're not going to provide enough aid. Right. And so that's going to create uh, that in and of itself is going to create conver- the need for conversations within states about how do we raise the revenue that we need. Um, and I do think that the pandemic and the recession and the, the federal government's policies over the last few years have created an environment where we are talking about some of these systemic factors more at a more serious in a more serious way. It's uh, um, so you know we're certainly encouraging uh, state policymakers to think about how do we better tax wealth. How do we and and the issue of economic development, sub, so-called economic development subsidies that you lifted, is uh, an important one. We spend a, we spend billions of dollars nationally on subsidies for of questionable value. Um, how do we turn the? How do we think about how we are raising the revenue that we need in an equitable way, and spending it in ways that are actually improving our lives? Uh, and not just enriching a few. Well, we're going to have to keep track of this, and I suspect that because the federal government is not going to give the money that the state needs, we're going to have to have you back and analyze the holes that we're looking at down the road and also try to be optimistic about what we can do. Thanks for being on the show. I appreciate the chance. Nice talking to you.